Good morning, everyone. My name is City Councilor at Large Michael Flaherty, joined by my colleague, City Councilor at Large Aaron Murphy. And today we are here uh, to discuss uh, three public safety and criminal justice committee hearing dockets docket 0108, <coughs> docket 0109, and docket 0110. Uh, we are currently in the Ionella Chamber, and uh, there's also video conferencing available for members of the public. Um, today is January the 24th. Uh, we are here today uh, to discuss these grants. The hearing will be recorded and will be live streamed at www.boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV and on Xfinity 8, RCN 82, and Fios 964. Specifically, the committee will be hearing the following dockets that I will now read into the record. Target 0108, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $13,520,000 in the form of a grant for continued support of planning, exercises, trainings, and operational needs that will assist in building enhanced and sustainable security capacities to help prevent, respond to, and recover from threats to acts of terrorism, including chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosive incidents awarded by the United States Department of Homeland Security passed through the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to be administered by the Department of Energy and Management. The grant will fund federal fiscal year 2022 urban area security initiative that was referred to the committee uh, on November 30th, 2022. Target 0109 message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $1,169,623 in the form of a grant for the Boston Providence Regional Catastrophic Preparedness Project through which we will work to close known cap capability gaps, encourage innovative regional solutions to issues related to catastrophic incidents, and build in existing regional preparedness efforts. Awarded by the United States Department of Homeland Security, passed through the Federal Emergency <laughs> Management Agency to be administered by the Department of Homeland Security. The grant will fund federal fiscal year 2022 regional catastrophic preparedness. That also was referred to the committee on November 30th, 2022. In docket 0110, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $567,000 in the form of a grant fiscal year 23 state information system improvements awarded by the United States Department of Transportation passed through the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to be administered by the Police Department. The grant will fund specialized equipment for 564 marked and unmarked cruises to implement motor vehicle automated citation and crash system in Boston. The e-citation technology issues electronic traffic citations, which can be printed out uh, in the police cruises. That was referred to the committee on December 14th, and uh, Mayor Wu had sponsored uh, all of these dockets. Um, if uh, We've also been joined by my colleague, City Council President Ed Flynn. If members of the public would like to provide public testimony, they can sign up at the sheet uh, as you come in the door uh, to the podium to my left. Members of the public may also provide testimony via Zoom or provide written comments to the committee that will be part of the public record and shared with the members of the Boston City Council. Members of the public should email Christine O'Donnell, uh, who is seated behind me, at christine.odonnell, O-D-O-N-N-E-L-L, -L, at boston.gov, to request the testimony link for public testimony via Zoom. Members of the public can also email the City Council Committee at ccc.ps at boston.gov. That's ccc.ps at boston.gov to provide written testimony. I'd also like to stress that we need information from people who are providing public testimony via video conference, especially if you are dialing in with a phone number or if you have an unrecognizable username. So please make sure that your name, full name, appears on the Zoom. Uh, with us today, we have uh, Chief uh, Shemaine Benford, uh, who we've done a lot of work with here on the council uh, as part of uh, Office of Emergency Management, and we also have uh, Deputy Superintendent uh, Christopher Walsh, uh, who is also here with us from the Boston Police Department uh, Office of Emergency Management. So with that, uh, turn it over to you three gentlemen. Ideally, probably uh, makes sense to maybe, um, since all three dockets are in front of us, to maybe discuss uh, all three in uh, order that they were read, and then we can engage in uh, some questions and answers. I'm sure my colleagues will be joining uh, as the hearing proceeds. So uh, without further ado, I'll defer it to the gentleman in front of me to offer opening statements on behalf of the administration. Thank you, Councilors. Uh, Deputy, do you want to go first? You can go first. Okay, yeah. Dynamite. Um, so thank you very much. I greatly appreciate uh, the opportunity to be before you again this morning. Um, I want to start uh, by uh, joining uh, certainly the mayor of uh, this city uh, and recognizing the victims and the families uh, in California. Uh, there was another shooting uh, early this morning um, where uh, there were potentially up to eight victims uh, that were impacted. So again, 
um, you know, they're in our thoughts and prayers, and much of the work that we do um, is to ensure that we have the capacity to respond uh, here locally so that hopefully we can prevent it, but if we do experience it, have the capacity to respond to it. Um, with regards to UASI, uh, I'll jump right in. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, sir, uh, this is a uh, grant that is a awarded uh, through the Department of Homeland, uh, Homeland, Homeland Security, uh, and very specifically uh, FEMA. Uh, from a historical perspective, uh, the purpose, as you mentioned, sir, uh, for the UASI grant is to prevent and respond to acts of terrorism, but it also gives us the capacity to respond to uh, man-made acts of uh, man-made acts of violence, as well as non-man-made and unplanned uh, acts of uh, major event that may happen against our city and or region. Uh, the grant program was stood up shortly after 9-11 as a mechanism to ensure that there was coordination uh, between uh, levels of government and resources so that we can ensure that we had a more protected and capacity built um, uh, public safety force uh, so that we could respond uh, to these different acts. There are six national priorities, sir. Um, when we think about the funding uh, for FY22, it is 16.9 million. As you mentioned, the state is the state administrative agent. Uh, the grant is for 16.9 million. 20% uh, is uh, tapped uh, at the state level uh, for support at that level, which ultimately results in the 13.52 that you mentioned, sir, coming into the MBHSR, uh, MBHSR reason. Uh, it's uh, important to note that there are six national priority areas that come with the grant and the notice of funding opportunity. Those national priority areas are soft targets and crowded spaces, which requires a mandatory 3% funding. Information and intelligence sharing, additionally 3%. Domestic violent extremism, 3%. This is an emerging uh, area of unfortunate violence that we're experiencing and seeing uh, very recently. Community preparedness and resilient, 3%. And then there is cybersecurity and election security. And what we know in those two areas is while they're national priority areas, they are not mandatory sources of minimum funding per this grant, but they do want to see initiatives that go to support it. That's uh, cybersecurity and elections. It is also important to note that our threat ranking through a risk methodology that is done by FEMA has gone up this year. So we were recently uh, given our threat ranking, uh, and we went from 12 to 11, which recognizes uh, the national and international prominence of our city, as well as the type of events, uh, the type of uh, infrastructure that we have in our city, and most importantly, our positioning as part of our national infrastructure. The Metro Boston Homeland Security Region is the local legal entity that receives the grant on behalf of the Boston region. Their sole, their sole purpose is to manage the grant. There are nine jurisdictions with Boston as the core city. They include Brookline, Cambridge, Chelsea, Everett, Quincy, Revere, Somerville, and Winthrop. It is governed by a JPOC, which is short for Jurisdictional Point of Contact, which is typically awarded to the chief executive and delegated down to an appropriate representative of local government. Within that infrastructure, we have what is referred to as subcommittees. These subcommittees serve as the subject matter experts. They're, they're not only comprised of subcommittees uh, that represent public safety, they also represent public health, uh, as well as other disciplines in the discussion. Their specific role is to help identify within the program area. And the MBHSR program is one that is submitted to the state and is also submitted to FEMA and is adopted and recognized by FEMA as a program that is supported by the USC grant. They adopt programs and fill gaps in our capacity based on their subject matter expertise that is then referred and recommended to the JPOC for funding and support of those program areas. There are nine goal areas within our program. They are safety and security. They are critical infrastructure. They are intel and info sharing. They are Ciberni, which is short for chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosive. They are med surge. They are planning and community preparedness, which includes the ability to support volunteers. They are cybersecurity. 
And then lastly, there is program management, which largely supports uh, emergency management and the ability uh, through our primary role of supporting uh, the MBHSR as the fiscal uh, for, uh, fiduciary agent and administrator support. It is important to note uh, this morning, Mr. Chair, uh, that we do not, OEM does not make executive financial decisions on behalf of the region. It is done through that body and through that mechanism, through the jurisdictional points of contact as recommended uh, through the subcommittees, and that's where those financial decisions are made. OEM serves as the administrative support in ensuring that it is done through a legal lens. As stewards uh, of the public's money, uh, we all endeavor and are committed to transparency and accountability. Um, I've been very clear in all of my testimony uh, that we are committed to that. We have, never remain, uh, we have never wavered, and we remain committed to our community and the difficult conversations to ensure that we're being held to that high standard. I want to just briefly mention just several examples of how these resources have enabled our city and our region to be responsive. When we think about target hardening, we think about City Hall and the measures that we have in place to ensure that it's a safe place for, for, for people like yourselves to work and for members of our community to come and visit uh, the, uh, the, gov uh, the uh, People's Building. We have things like the U.S. Open, where it happened in our region. Brookline is a party to our region. We have a vested interest in ensuring that we have open and candid conversations with our colleagues across government and across public self, uh, safety to ensure that we protect our region. If you think about where that was held, it is on the border of West Roxburgh, so we have a vested interest. We have First Night, the Marathon. Places like Revere hold the, uh, the Sand Castle event each year. We have the Mayor's State of the City that's going to come up. We have elections. We have intelligence that's used to help inform us on how to ensure that our children are safe when they're going to school and when we're starting our school years. The Health Commission and EMS hosted a domestic violence extremism training uh, this, within the past six months. That's extremely helpful in ensuring that we understand, A, how to respond, but also to understand how do we better prepare policy and response through a public health lens. We have drowning victims for which we've been able to use equipment to bring dignified closure to families that suffered loss. EMS re relies on vital uh, medical supplies to help support the response. We have countless civic events that happen across all of our neighborhoods throughout the year. Video messaging boards, things that we take for granted that help us divert traffic are all resources that are procured with this grant and help to, again, make our city and our region as safe as we can. PPE that has been not only um, available to support public safety, but to support our neighborhoods, to support our schools, to support our neighborhood health centers. Resources were helped and supported through this grant. Boston Fire Department uses equipment to hopefully and successfully address the scourge of fire, to help with building collapse. We had the unfortunate incident over here at the Congress Street Garage last year. We had another incident, uh, Mr. President, over in your district over in South Boston at the Edison plant. Urban search and rescue, which is one of our goal areas. Equipment, vital training, that is critical. And but not for that training, but not for those resources, but not for that capacity, we may not have experienced what we could certainly characterize as an extremely fortunate outcome in seeing that uh, that victim survive that incident. We also have what is pressing before us, the migrant response. It is something that we're hearing from our national colleagues and we are experiencing it locally. Mr. Chair, we are a major city. We have national and international standing. We must have the capacity to respond and keep our region and our city safe. It would be a challenge and perhaps improbable in some instances to maintain a readiness posture in an ever-changing and evolving society. As I close, sir, we are committed to transparency and accountability as I opened with. I appreciate, recognize, and respect the role and the leadership of the mayor, this body, our MBHSR partners, the state, the community, the OEM staff, as well as the advocates that we have to engage in these very difficult conversations. 
I encourage this committee to make a full recommendation to the full council to accept these resources so that we can continue the conversation as well as arrive at a point that is acceptable and reasonable based on the reality that we face in keeping our city and our region safe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chief. And um, Deputy Superintendent, you have the floor. All right. good, good morning. Uh, my name is Deputy Superintendent Christopher Walsh from the Boston Police Department. I appreciate the time and uh, from Councilors Flynn, Flaherty, and Murphy. And I, I'm going to read a short summary of the, uh, the e-citation project. Um, I provided this to the council previously for the record. The Boston Police was awarded the federal fiscal year 2023 state, state traffic safety information system improvement grant Section 405 funding for $567,000 on November 3rd of 2022. This grant is funded by the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration through the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security and the Office of Grants and Research. The grant funds will be used to install computer equipment, specifically mobile printers and up to 564 Boston Police uh, vehicle fleet the citation, e-citation transition program will commence installation by April of 2023 and will be completed by August of 2023. The grant closeout will be September 30th of 2023. This grant was applied for on June 16th as a one-time grant to enable the Boston Police Department to participate in the Department of Criminal Justice Information Services, Motor Vehicle Automated Citation and Crash System, which is the MAC system. The requirements of the grant was to align the Boston Police Department with the 2019 State Traffic Records Assessment regarding citation and adjudication recommendations, including the improvement of citation description and content, citation data quality control through integration uniformity, completeness, completeness, accuracy, and timeliness. The benefits of the police departments will participate in the e-citation portion of MACS, where officers issue electronic citations to motorists for traffic violations by printing out a letter size paper copy of the citation using these in-vehicle mobile printers. The goals and benefits of, for e-citation is to improve the officer safety, to streamline data collection, to improve data quality, to eliminate redundant data entry processes, and to improve the timeliness of reporting. This grant will provide the front funds to purchase and install in-vehicle mobile printers. The data from e-citations within MAX is handled by the RMV Merit Rating Board. The Merit Rating Board is currently working under its own OGR 405C grant to implement a portal for e-citations. The data collected by the Merit Rating Board for e-citations will be available for download into the Boston Police Record Management System for data storage and analytics. The main purpose and primary benefit of this is to enable the Boston Police Department to access, access and analyze citation data written by Boston Police officers. With the analysis of traffic citation data, we can then work with the City of Boston um, agencies to better manage resources, identify locations where there is a high prevalence of violations, and provide additional information to the public regarding traffic safety. The administration, the, the grant will be managed by the Boston Police Department Office of Research and Development under the direction of Maria Chivas, who is the director of ORD and I will be handling the project management of this project. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Superintendent. So I'll obviously start with that uh, docket. So as it stands now, um, someone goes through, say, a red light, or they're speeding, they get pulled over, uh, license registration, and then an officer would be in his or her vehicle, you know, handwriting, I guess, the citation, and then would be sort of ripping off a portion, giving it to the driver, and then takes the receipt, if you will, back to what the station and then it gets processed and then sends sends it to the court or to the registry, depending on what type of chapter 90 violation it is. Um, 
Is that that's fairly accurate in terms of kind of how it works now? That is accurate. And then now, um, someone goes through, say, the red light or the speeding officer would come up, get their license, the registration, go back to the vehicle. There's, um, if you identified, there'd be um, 564 marked or unmarked cruises that would be equipped with this technology. Um, and then the officer would then be entering the, the data into a computer system of some sort on the dashboard. And then it would print out on the dashboard uh, a copy of the receipt or the ticket, which would then be handed to the operator of the motor vehicle. And then the other information would probably automatically just be uploaded to the system back at the station or directed to either the courts or to the registry of motor vehicles. Is that? That is correct. Uh, the, uh, the process currently used is when, when officers stop a vehicle, they uh, run the operator of the vehicle inside uh, CGIS, the computer system that's uh, in the vehicle. And then they use that information to hand write that, those tickets, as you mentioned. The new system, they still do that. They still run the operator or the, the vehicle inside of CGIS. But the information is now automatically transferred to the, the citation, the e-citation. So they don't have to do any of that duplication of work. Mm -hmm. they, and their attention is less divided now. They're not mm -hmm. looking down and writing tickets where they can see the screen and, and what's in, happening in front, in front of them. them. Situational awareness. And then that information is all electronically transmitted to the DRV and the Metro Rating Board. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have some accountability and audit features as well. And, and so you'd have an officer maybe writing the ticket, looking the old school way, look, writing down, and then gets back. And then someone's typing that data, I assume, later on into the system. Correct. And with typos and maybe the address or the name spelt wrong. Um, so from an accuracy standpoint, I, I could probably see a, a significant uptick in terms of um, situational awareness and, and the accuracy of the ticket and violation and that information being entered into the system almost in real time, if you will, uh, with the license and registration in front of the officer who's entering the data. So, And then there's, um, are these, the cruises, are they going to be dedicated sort of traffic patrol or to these sort of hot spots, um, high traffic areas to you know, it's, we all of us can uh, can attest to going to community meetings, and every community civic meeting usually starts with um, our community police officers. You know, issuing, you know, just indicating or um, updating the community, if you will, on to the last months could be arrests and car breaks and etc. Um, and we hear it all the time that folks want uh, want to see more police officers in the streets and in the neighborhoods, and they also want more dedicated sort of traffic patrols. Uh, in some instances, they'd love to see the city of Boston have its own dedicated sort of tra Boston Police Traffic Division, and that's all they do is traffic calming and pedestrian safety and uh, speeding and um, cycle safety type of stuff. But um, I know our districts are strapped and struggling, obviously, for resources and trying to keep up with attrition, so not a lot of our captains have the ability to assign sort of specific traffic divisions, but we know, I can attest, we hear that pretty regularly in every neighborhood, talking about the speeding cars and uh, people cutting through their neighborhoods at a high rate of speed, uh, trying to beat the traffic, et cetera. So hopefully this technology will allow uh, men and women of the Boston Police Department to be able to obviously do their job uh, more efficiently. The situ situational awareness is critical, but also being able to get that information timely and accurately to the motorist, but also into the system. Uh, reducing and eliminating sort of the duplicative piece that comes with uh, maybe errors and uh, incomplete forms and things of that nature. So I appreciate your uh, time and attention to this matter and turn it over to my colleagues in their uh, order of their arrival uh, on docket, uh, this docket here with respect to the Deputy Superintendent, Chair recognizes City Council, Aaron Murphy. Thank you, Council of Clarity. Um, thank you for being here and for that thorough overview. And um, I do have to say our, our city is lucky to have both of you. Um, the way you went through all of these grants um, and explained the importance of it and how we will continue to be a safer city with these. So definitely in support of these grants and reading through and listening to your um, report of them also, you can never be too prepared, right, for um, any catastrophic event. And we are experiencing them and seeing them um, across the country. So thank you for, um, that and making sure that these grants are you know, awarded to the Boston Police Department so we can continue to be prepared and our c citizens are safe and 
your offices are, um, you know, have the proper training to make sure they can respond when needed. And I agree with Councilor Flaherty when he mentioned the, you know, safety of traffic. It's something that comes up a lot, and I know Council President Flynn is a strong advocate about street safety and making sure that our roads are safe for not just um, cyclists but also our pedestrians. So. All of these are important grants that are vital to our city, so thank you for that and nothing else. Thank you, Council Murphy. Chair and this Councilor President Ed Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the Chief for being here and to the Deputy Superintendent for being here as well. But more importantly, thank you for the important work you're doing across Boston's neighborhoods. Um, so one of the one of the things I, I wanted to f ask first is, um, Chief, I know you highlighted Boston being ranked ranked from 12th to 11th based on various um, various issues. And Boston is certainly an international city that hosts major events that you highlighted, including all the major colleges and universities that, and hospitals that are here in Boston and Cambridge as well. Um, and I, I, I do agree with, I do agree with you in the important role safety plays in major American cities. I had the opportunity to serve 25 years in the U.S. Navy, including overseas, so I'm very familiar with a lot of the issues that you highlighted. Um, the, the, the question I have is the, the ranking from 12 to 11, and why is that important for the, I know the answer, but I'm, I'm, I want to make sure the public knows this as well, but why is it important for the public to know the important work that you and your team are doing to keep our city and neighborhoods and surrounding cities and towns safe, even though we may not physically see the presence of Boston police working, working on these issues. Why is it important to educate the public about what you're doing? Sir, th thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for your service. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, one, it's important to educate the public because we're in service to them. Right, and I, as, as long as we don't educate, as long as we're unwilling to have these public conversations, particularly from an inf informational standpoint, uh, the more it fodders and leaves open for misinterpretation. So one, um, at the highest level, uh, in service uh, to the people and as stewards of, uh, of their resources. Secondly, when we think about lessons learned out of 9-11, we know that there were uh, catastrophic and unfortunate lessons learned as a result of lack of coordination lack of exchange of information. And when we think about our intelligence sharing, when we think about our fusion centers, there is a very clear deconfliction process where this information, this intelligence comes in. It enables multiple levels of government to look and assess this data in determining how best to respond to it. Whether there is a national priority, whether it's a local-based issue, and in some instances it's pushed all the way down that this is a non-issue, right? So. We've learned from those lessons. The, uh, the federal government has made these resources available to ensure that they were responsive in hearing some of the complaints and concerns about not sharing information, but also recognizing that our cities and our local jurisdictions, excuse me, play a role in how we secure our city. And there is a national and a vested interest. So there were some lessons uh, that were learned from there. With regards to uh, the ranking, the ranking is critical because it recognizes all of those different uh, instances that you've talked about. So our colleges and, university, uh, uh, and universities, our infrastructure, our medical communities, our uh, major events that we have, the types of uh, dignitaries uh, that, we, that we host here, very similar to the mayor several weeks ago uh, with hosting uh, the, pr uh, the prince and princess uh, and coming to our city. So it recognizes all of those events and they tie it to and make a correlation between, as a major city, as a viable entity in how our, how our nation is constructed and how we go about doing business, it's very clear that the federal government has a vested interest and they recognize our city, they recognize what it is that we have to deal with, 
and they have uh, certain levels of SEER ratings, which is a rating that the federal government attaches to certain instances where, through an assessment process, they determine that there are national implications. So, sir, it's extremely important, one, that we educate the public in understanding that this is not an insular process. It's really an open process to ensure that our region is safe. Secondly, when we think about the geographical uh, makeup of our city and our region, I think about uh, a storm several years ago, um, for those that may or may not know, uh, but the Myrtle Beach area, right, they have US 17, which is a major roadway that goes into it. And I think about the response down there in terms of how they were able to move people in and out of that city and in that region. They were able to take US 17 in the opposite direction, shut it down, and shepherd people out. Well, if you think about our urban, uh, uh, geographical strong uh, construct, that's not our reality. If you live in the Dorchester area, uh, particularly the Neponset area, there's a strong likelihood that if something impacts that neighborhood, it could impact Quincy. And if some, something impacts the northern section of Quincy, it could impact Dorchester. So it's extremely important to A, educate our, uh, educate our community and our public, but also have a coordinated response and an open conversation with how we go about ensuring a readiness posture in the region. And so the last thing that I would, uh, that I would point you on is, is when we think about the MBHSR, Boston is the core city. So when this region was stood up, it was recognized that Boston is the anchor. As we are the economic engine for New England, we are also the core uh, in this MBHSR region, holding you know, nearly 700,000 residents mm -hmm. uh, in this region. So it's extremely important that we recognize all of those pieces um, when we advocate for and we have this conversation around security and posture. Thank you, Chief, and thank you for your, to your team. And I have one, one final comment before I ask a, a brief question to the Deputy Superintendent. Um, and we also know I've been working closely with Council Flaherty and Senator Collins and Congressman Lynch in improving our port, getting cruise ships into Boston, working closely with Massport, with the Boston Place, with the Boston Fire, but also <clears throat> working with the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Coast Guard as uh, more cargo ships come into Boston, um, and including LNG tankers that have, had a, that have been here. But we know the important role the Port of Boston plays, not just in our city, but really in the country. So that's, um, it's important that we continue to work on public safety issues in and around Boston's port. So again, just want to say thank you to you, Chief, and your team for the important work you're doing. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Um, thank you, Deputy Superintendent, as well for, for, your, for your team's work on on so many issues. Um, so Deputy Superintendent, my question is, as we roll out these uh, new vehicles with this advanced technology, what is the training that you and your team are able to provide the um, offices that will be utilizing these vehicles, um, enabling them to have the, the, the right training at the right time so that they can uh, effectively do their job with this new computerized system to um, give out um, important work to important paperwork. I appreciate your uh, your question, uh, Councillor. Uh, we're going to be working with DC GIS and the RMV directly because they do have a, a training program in place. Uh, they've been working uh, through this process with other municipalities for the last few years. Um, getting the state police is one of them up, up and running on this as well as I think they have over 200 municipalities taking place uh, taking part of these citations at this time uh, We'll be working with them through our Academy as well. We have e-learning and uh, I have a, a team of officers that work for me that can also uh, do some hands-on training on how to use the uh, the equipment <clears throat> excuse me and and print out you know, the citations and, and the process to do that. Go, uh, thank you, thank you, Deputy. Going yeah. forward, will the, will this training take place also in the, um, for the recruits at the training, training academy? Oh, absolutely, we'll, we'll be working with the academy to make sure that all the recruits that come in have their proper training. Thank you, Deputy. Um, I have no further questions. Uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council President. Uh, just a couple, uh, Chief, if you don't sure. mind. So we went from 12 to 11 in the uh, the threat ranking. Do you know, if, do you know the, who the top 10 are off the top of your head? 
Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but I think we'll, uh, I can certainly identify uh, just based on the, the national standing. So typically we see at the top of that pendulum, we're going to see the New Yorks, we're going to see D.C., we're going to see Chicago, we're going to see L.A. Gotcha. Um, I can certainly uh, get access to uh, a definitive list on that. Based and the on ranking the based on sort of the day-to-day -day activity, sort of the crime activity, or is it also mass shootings and things that are happening on their transit system and stuff of that nature? I appreciate that, sir. So I think what we're seeing when we talk about um, domestic violence extremism, right, we're, we're, we're attempting to learn that, understand that better, uh, which is why they've identified it um, as a national priority area. And I think as a result of that, it is forcing us into that space where we can no longer look at some of the instances and some of the experiences that we're having and not draw the connection to simply say that it's neighborhood violence, right? When we're having uh, events that are resulting in 10, 15 uh, individuals that have been harmed or victimized, we have to look at that through a broader lens uh, to better understand that and ensure that it doesn't fall within this. And I think that there's probably a credible argument that could, that could be made looking at the data, no doubt about it, uh, that there is probably some correlation to mental health, um, extremism, um, and very uh, polarizing views uh, that's, that's driving some of this violence. Richard. And uh, more often than not, at least as it pertains to the city, we've had incidents here in the city, and then uh, when uh, those individuals get apprehended, they're not from Boston. Uh, they hail from other communities or other states, but come here, I guess, uh, sort of hell-bent on uh, wreaking havoc, making a statement, being part of a, a, a cause or a group or an organization, but more often than not, uh, they're not from Boston, but yet, you know, makes national news and arguably gives Boston a bad name when, in fact, no, any of the folks that were there and participating and crossing the line beyond sort of free speech are not from uh, the neighborhoods of Boston, which is always, you know, uh, disheartening and frustrating to see. Um, question on, um, I guess as a, as a follow-up to, to our ranking, the you had referenced the six uh, sort of national, I think it's priorities and principles. It's uh, yes, the first one was soft target. Soft targets and crowded spaces, yes, sir. And then the, ex the second one was info, information sharing, okay. and, and intelligence. Domestic violence and domestic violence extremism was three. What was the fourth one? Community pre preparedness and resilience. Community preparedness. And then it's cyber and um, election security. Yes, sir. Got you. Perfect. And then just uh, lastly, any thoughts and ideas on how we could collaborate and make our schools safer. Uh, we've had a number of incidents uh, over the last several years, particularly even just this school year, where just the level of violence uh, taking place um, during school or even on the way to school or the way home from school with being weapons recovered, uh, shots fired, uh, and just the overall bullying and uh, some of it starts uh, with cyberbullying and then manifests itself out in the hallways and inside of, outside of classrooms. So, I guess any thoughts and ideas as to how uh, you know your organization can partner, obviously, with Boston Police and our Boston Public Schools. Um, last several years, it seems to be a sure. They had the partnership hasn't been as strong. We're blessed. We have a new superintendent and Superintendent Skipper. We've got a new police superintendent uh, and commissioner and Commissioner Cox. Seems like the spirit of collaboration um, has been uh, a hell of a lot better than it's been in the past. With uh, Superintendent Skipper's predecessor not wanting to partner and engage uh, with uh, our Boston Police Department. So the good news is that there's communication, there's partnership, there's a shared responsibility to make our uh, schools and our city safer. I guess the question is, is there any role for any of this grant money, if you will, to, to go to making our schools um, safer? Sure. Um, thank you for the question. Um, so a, a couple things I want to recognize. I certainly, uh, you know, want to recognize my colleagues um, and the work that they're doing, namely the superintendent uh, and the police commissioner, and really opening up um, and sending very clear signals of the, the need and the willingness to uh, collaborate so that we can uh, community, uh, community problem solve, right? Whole of community approach to uh, public safety. Um, I think that there are a couple of things I, that I want to recognize even above that, right, is the mayor's leadership. Uh, the ability to, for us all to have that conversation uh, and the flexibility to work across and through those silos uh, to come up with uh, reasonable alternatives as to how we approach violence. There's no doubt uh, that, uh, that uh, violence in our schools is a concern. Um, I had uh, sort of, uh, you know, one of those moments when I was dropping my daughter off uh, a couple of weeks ago. I paused at the door as I was pressing the buzzer to get in, and I just in that moment thought about, wow, what if I came back at 5 o'clock and she wasn't here? Or there wasn't 
there was an event, right? Those are things that we all have to recognize as parents, loved ones, and as a community. I think there are uh, tremendous opportunities uh, for us as we think about the broad, the broad work that's going on, which is a collaborative cross-department uh, conversation that's happening around the approach to violence. Um, I think that that's you know one tremendous area that we're looking at to better understand it. Um, we've ex we for many many years, uh, you know, we excommunicated the public health uh, role uh, in that and understanding uh, the implications of that. So I think better understanding that helps us come up with uh, better pathways uh, and better ways to create strategies. And I also think that when we think about community preparedness sort of under this uh, umbrella of a national priority. I think that there are tremendous opportunities as we're looking to build out a volunteer core program. How do we uh, use those resources? How do we use training? How do we bring the community into that process so that they're active stakeholders in how we go about policing and how we go about problem solving in our schools? So to answer your question, sir, I, I do believe that under that umbrella of community preparedness, particularly as we're looking to build out our volunteer core, I think that there's tremendous opportunity to partner up with the other work that's going on in the administration and across the city uh, to come up with some alternatives. And thank you, Chief. That's great to hear, obviously, and um, uh, if there's a takeaway, obviously, from this hearing is that uh, working, obviously, with the mayor's office and uh, reaching out and making yourself available to our school superintendent and any potential resources uh, that uh, you have uh, or in your organization and team have that may be able to, to lend a hand uh, to what is obviously a very serious issue, but again, we're blessed we have a superintendent under the mayor's leadership who is, uh, who is uh, two hands on the wheel and recognizes that this is a very important critical issue. If you don't feel safe uh, on the way to school, at school, and on the way home from school, you're not learning. Yes, sir. And uh, we're missing the boat on that one. We're in a global economy uh, and we're trying to prepare the next generation to be able to compete. Uh, in the workforce and in the world, and uh, if they're worried about, you know, uh, getting bullied or picked on or threatened or beat up, then that day is basically a lost day in terms of teaching and learning. So uh, anything that you can do in your in your, in your capacity, uh, in any funds that are available that might be able to help our new school superintendent uh, deal with the issues of public safety that are impacting uh, our school children and their families would be uh, would be. Uh, greatly appreciated. So, and I know that you've done great work here and you've got the relationships across the board um, here at the council, but yes. you know, all the agencies of the city under the administration's um, um, stewardship and uh, and anything we can do to make our schools safe would be, would be awesome. And because we, we've all been touring schools with our superintendent and working with our commissioners and uh, was at an elementary school um, recently in, um, didn't, wasn't really aware of this, but um, in talking to the principal, I learned that there was there were 40, there's 40, it's an elementary school and they had 49 doors. And I sort of thought about that and then I let, so I'm still thinking about that. Uh, you know, you think that so there's the front door of the school and then you get emergency exits. But um, that's one of her concerns every day. She grapples with the fact that she has 49 doors and she's overseeing several hundred children in an elementary school. I know that there's schools that actually have more doors than that. There's obviously some that have less doors than that, but sure. just the thought of an elementary school having 49 doors uh, where folks you know, have uh, either access to get in or out of uh, kind of throws your mind a little bit. Uh, and then when I asked the question, is, this, is that the most amount of doors and learn that no, there's some schools that have 70, 80, there's a couple schools that have over 100 doors. Um, just goes to show you in terms of the structure, the infrastructure, the preparedness, things of sure. that nature, and anything, anytime anything can happen, um, and making sure that we have uh, the resources, the technology, and again, the plan and the preparedness in the event of an incident. Uh, I think your team and department could be critical in helping uh, our school department work through sort of some potential scenarios that we might be able to uh, lend your time and talents and experience and, sure. uh, and resources to helping and maybe kind of eliminating some of the, those potential headaches. So, so just opining a little bit, but I just thought it was important, that, especially given that the whole list of the national priorities and the rankings and uh, all the criteria that go into what you do, uh, several of them touch on sort of the day-to-day -day activities here in our city and particularly in our schools. So with that, and my colleagues have any follow-up questions, Councilor Murphy, uh, Councilor Flynn? And uh, seeing uh, anyone wishing to offer uh, public testimony may do so. Christine, do we have anyone had signed in? Uh, no one had indicated sign in, and we have nothing online. 
and nothing uh, via Zoom. So, uh, with that, unless uh, you gentlemen have anything further uh, for this committee, like we're closing out the chair, actually, we'll recognize Council President Ed Flynn. Yeah, thank you, Council Flaherty, for giving me the giving me an opportunity to close out um, on, a, on a couple of comments. We're, set, we're starting the Luna New Year, and I represent the largest Asian community in Boston, large community obviously in Chinatown, but also a large Asian community in the South End, in the Bay Village, parts of Beacon Hill and Back Bay, and in South Boston we have an Asian community as well. Um, <clears throat> I was with the police commissioner last night at the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association banquet celebrating the start of Lunar New Year with, with Mayor Wu as well. Um, I had an opportunity to talk to residents at the banquet, but also prior to that, I had the opportunity to talk to Chinatown residents um, on Beach Street, on, on Neyland Street, on Lincoln Street. The Leather District also has a large Chinese community. Um, but I guess my question or comment to, to you, Chief, is as we, as we go forward in celebrating Loon and New Year, the, the contributions, the sacrifices that the Asian community have made to our city and country, um, it's also important to recognize the horrific killings in California um, targeted towards the Asian community, maybe. Um, but also to, to be aware, to be prepared, to know exactly what's happening in and around greater Boston, to have, to make sure residents feel comfortable knowing that the police are, are available, they're doing their due diligence, which I know they are, but also having police walking, walking the, around the community and talking to residents is also, is also an important aspect of it. We also have a large number of Asian police officers in the city of Boston that do a tremendous job, and they play a critical role in the city of Boston. And I know many of them personally, and they're very professional and dedicated and hardworking, but I just wanted to highlight the important role Boston police play in our communities, in our neighborhoods, interacting with our residents, small businesses. Um, they don't get the credit that they're looking for. I don't, I don't think they're looking for credit, but they are looking for us as city officials to, to treat them with respect. And I hope, I hope we can continue doing that and acknowledging the important role that Boston police play in all of our neighborhoods in a professional manner. So. Again, just want to say thank you to you, Deputy Superintendent, and also want to say thank you to you, Chief, as well. Thank you, sir. Thank Mr. You, sir. Chair, could I just offer thank one you, Council, 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 um, Thank President you very much, sir, yeah. for that. And Good I just want to pass on, um, just very quickly, when I was uh, talking about the uh, MBHSR, sir, I, um, I, I, I fully agree with you um, and support and recognize not only the work uh, that our police department is doing, um, but all of our public safety officials. I know that in many instances, uh, the police department serve as the lightning rod for some of our challenges, and I think that we can have those difficult conversations, not to speak for the police department or out of that lane, um, but want to uh, want them to know, as well as our community, uh, that they're all supported um, and that we're all committed to having those difficult conversations uh, because we all have a credible um, and very uh, necessary role in our society. So I do recognize uh, all of them. And I just want to close, Mr. Chair, by just mentioning just around this conversation around transparency and accountability, uh, with regards to the MBHSR, it is worthy to note that we meet in public meetings monthly. So they're publicly disclosed. Um, I know that there, right, there have been conversations around, uh, cl uh, you know, clouds of secrecy and, and, and decisions being made. We do have a very open and candid, uh, you know, uh, robust uh, meeting schedule, and it is a public meeting schedule. So okay. I just want to pass that. And, uh, thank you, Chief. We've just been joined by our colleague, City Council Liz Braden. Um, and uh, just a final question I had on the uh, Boston Providence Regional uh, Catastrophic yes, Preparedness. And you just, just briefly described, I guess, what our relationship is with, uh, that's obviously the state of Rhode Island, of course. So, so Boston has a partnership with Providence, Rhode Island. Sure. 
and then I'm assuming that the communities in between here in Providence are involved in that at some capacity. Can you just maybe shed light on what that's all about? And I, I, I won't be too lengthy with it. Uh, the Regional Catastrophic uh, Preparedness Grant Program, uh, it, it plays an important role in the implementation of the National Preparedness uh, and uh, the National Preparedness System, which incorporates a number of different models in the uh, National Incident Management System and ICS, which are really standardized models for how we can respond to violence. It, it creates a national framework that allows for us to seamlessly integrate uh, with one framework and how we respond. Uh, it supports the building of our core cap capabilities and it specifically recognizes building a, a more secure and a more resilient uh, community, particularly through the lens of housing, logistics, uh, innovation, and supply chain. And I talked earlier when speaking uh, and offering comments about uh, UASI, it's very difficult with limited resources, right, to understand uh, and build that capacity. But I also point to another functional example of how and why this work is so important. Um, you know, I spoke with uh, Jorge uh, Hernandez uh, Rodriguez, excuse me, who is my counterpart down in El Paso, uh, right, ground zero for what's going on uh, right now. Um, and I reach out to him consistently trying to offer, uh, you know, uh, professional encouragement, uh, but also wellness tips on, you know, ensuring that you're, you know, in appropriate mental and physical space to continue this important work. But when we think about how our communities are being impacted uh, by the migrant crisis. And again, we're a welcoming, uh, sir, Mr. Chair, you talked about that earlier. We're a welcoming city, uh, but we also want to treat uh, individuals in a dignified way even as we respond. So the conversation around appropriate housing, timely housing, respectable and dignified housing, there is a direct correlation with the work that we're doing to understand those supply chains and build capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a real world example uh, that we're dealing with. When we talk about, you mentioned Providence, when we look at our region and our geographical setup, uh, when we compete for these resources, the Reggie, as is commonly referred to as the Reggie Grant, uh, it's a competitive grant. And when we partner with, uh, with uh, regional uh, states as well as other jurisdictions, it enhances our capacity uh, to qualify for the resources. There is a direct benefit to our city. There's a direct benefit to our region. There is no way that we're going to be able to house hundreds of individuals depending upon what the crisis is without implications to the state, without partnerships and conversations with other cities and towns where resources and facilities may be available. So this allows us to not only engage this work and look at community engagement, uh, to look at how we uh, su uh, support emergency response, uh, partnering uh, with MIT who are subject matter experts in academia, uh, creating uh, hazard impact teams, um, and then lastly, you know, a small business uh, support kit, uh, toolkit on how we better understand this so that we as a city can be more responsive, but more importantly, it can help inform how we plan. So partnering with Providence, uh, we worked with the city of Providence, uh, and you know, and uh, we enjoyed the support uh, of the mayor here as well mm -hmm. as the mayor there in understanding uh, our two cities and really leveraging the information that we have in our two cities to better understand these issues in these core areas and build greater uh, resiliency in that space. Uh, but also help to inform our planning and future development of those plans so that informs our response. Sir. Okay. Thank you very much, Chief. Do you recognize my colleague Liz Braden at this time? Any questions of the panel? None, thank you. Right, no problem. So uh, obviously, Chief and uh, Deputy Superintendent, that will conclude uh, today's hearing uh, in the Public Safety Committee with respect to docket uh, 0108, 0109, and 0110. So hope to have a committee report uh, turned around relatively quickly and get it before the council for a vote. So we can get you both those very needed resources to have you guys carry out um, some of these important uh, priorities to keep our city and our neighborhoods safe. So with that, uh, with respect to those three dockets, uh, the chair on public safety and criminal justice committee hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Deputy.